Welcome back to the class. This is Herb First Aid. And this section is going to be on uh, why students of herbalism should know how to make proper plant identification. Uh, I guess to me it seems pretty obvious why someone would choose uh, study how to properly identify plants. Uh, but I think that a lot of people have a, a, a not very in-depth understanding, which is fine for most things, just looking at plants and enjoying them. But I think once we take the next move and we start to say we're going to put the we're going to put these plants in people's body for medicine, I think that plant identification uh, becomes very important. And what I mean by plant identification, I mean is accurate identifications on a species level to the plant. I'm not going to use a lot of terminology. Um, there are a few herb schools, mine included, Juliet's and Howie's, where if you're interested in studying botany on that level, I would suggest uh, going to one of our schools or some other place where you could uh, do an in-depth study of botany as well as herbal medicine. And so what I mean by botany, I mean is being able to use scientific keys in order to uh, eventually get to the correct species. Now it's difficult in the best of times, uh, so it's less difficult in the worst of times, which could be, you know, you have to know what the plan is, you don't have much time, the bugs are biting you, that whole wildcrafting scenario. What I want to do is talk about some of the basic ways of studying uh, plant identification and send, give some resources. Uh, but we're, what we're not going to do is I'm not going to start to go through how to identify plants accurately. And once again, by accurately, I mean to a species level. There are three main groups of plants that are important for herbalists to know in order to identify. There are families, genus, and species. The family of plants is a very wide scope of plants. Uh, every time a plant is related to each other, whether it's family, genus, or species, it has to do with the reproductive structures. Uh, that's how things are labeled and identified and categorized uh, by humans. I don't know how squirrels do it probably by smell and taste. Um, so for, but from our point of view, looking at the reproductive structures of plants, which means flowers, uh, does, it does help understand how they are related because the reproductive structures of plants, flowers, shows if they can breed together. And if for things could breed together, that means they have to have had evolutionary steps in the same direction. In other words, if a plant developed one course of action over here and a different course of action over here, they just developed independently of each other, they probably cannot breed together. Just to put it entirely differently, that's why all human beings are genus homo, species sapien. All human, breed, all human beings um, have basically the reproductive structures uh, despite small differences like color or form or, I don't know, the way they view the world, eccentricities, uh, we're basically based on our evolutionary characteristics of reproductive structures, meaning that uh, breedability. So, so the point is, in order to really accurately identify plants, you have to see the flowers. So that's going to limit many plants initially um, to being able to make accurate identification. Now sometimes there's exceptions, like many, most areas, especially in North America as opposed to Central America, have limited amounts of trees. So there are other ways that you can probably identify a tree without its flowers, and some other plants as well. But really, when you want to know exactly what species, and you don't have somebody there to tell you exactly what species, it's going to come down to flowers, because that's basically the evolutionary trait that uh, all this rides upon. So. This is my plea, my entreaty to all of you listening to spend some time and learn to accurately identify plants to a species level in whatever way you want. I didn't go to any formal schooling for it. I just got books out. Uh, these days there's great internet resources and in how to do that. I want to make some recommendations, a good site to learn about how to identify plants. One of them is called Wayne's Word, not Wayne's World, but Wayne's Word. If you type in Wayne's Word, you'll get to a, a nature study or a botany class. So that's one. Um, 
another book on not on how to identify plants rather than how to identify specific plants, but the general theme of how to identify plants is this book right here uh, by John, John James Kastner, and it's called The Photographic Atlas of Botany. And what Mr. Kastner has done in this book is he's taken lots of photographs of plants, he's photoshopped them in so you can really see the segments of the different families. As I started saying before, Basically, what's important for us to understand for plants is the family of the plant, the genus of the plant, and the species of the plant. A family is a large category where they have evolutionary traits, so it's not always so obvious. A genus, they're more closely related, and by the time you're calling a plant the same species, let's say dandelion, dandelion the family is the Asteraceae. The Asteraceae is the largest family of plants. Some have shared characteristics that are obvious, some don't. Then on the genus level is Taraxacum, so dandelion is Asteraceae family. Genus Taraxacum, there's a few Taraxacums, maybe can be used interchangeably, medicinally or edible, maybe not. And then on the species level, so dandelion species is a fishanel. So the family Asteraceae, the genus Taraxacum, the species a fishanel. So most people, if you're talking about dandelion, will just say, by, on a scientific level, we'll call it Taraxacum officinale. By the time you get to the species level, by the time I say it's Taraxacum officinale, genus species, I'm saying that all of those plants can probably breed together. Every plant that's Taraxacum officinale, once you're on the species level of something, it means that basically it's reproductively compatible with all other species. There are subgroups to this, but uh, that's for another time, a different course as well. And so what this book does is that he basically has photographs of the different families, and then he shows with really uh, excellent clarity and good uh, photography and good pointing out, he shows the different parts of it. And I really recommend this book. Uh, it's also, it's independently published. Um, the name of his press uh, just so really clear, I've never met James. I probably would like him if I met him, uh, but I have nothing involved in selling this book. I don't sell this book or make money. That's pretty much true with everything unless it's my own school. It's the Feline Press in Gainesville, Florida. I was just there. I should have uh, met him up. So, uh, so a book like this could be really helpful because then you can start, like you're, when you start to read the complicated stuff, you're like, I don't understand it, and then there it is. There's all the stamen and style and words that won't be covered here. So the first thing to do is to just start looking at flowers of plants and getting a really basic book, looking at the flowers and pulling them apart and learning how to identify plants. There are a lot of consistencies uh, in plants. So, um, and you can learn it with tenacity. If you just stay with it, you will learn how to identify plants and then you can impress your friends. In other words, you will put everybody to sleep around you but you'll have a good time doing it. So next, the, uh, I want to show a different book. This is not a very commonly sold book, but I really like it because this book goes one step further and does the gold standard of botany, which is black and white line illustrations of just a number of different plants, a number of families, a number of genera and species, and then you probably can't see it very clear from there but then just shows details of them. So you start to have a sense of how flowers, uh, the different parts of flowers, and other parts in this book. Uh, I'm not going to bother. This book is out of print and not very common. And if you watch that, you can see it's also falling apart. So find some websites that clearly show you how to do botanical identification. Um, Get some books with black and white line illustrations pointing to the parts. And then your next step is likely to be a general, non-specific field guide. Uh, a common series is Peterson's. Or books like this, which is, this is Newcomb's Wildflower Guide. And this is the classic book of the Northeast. And Newcomb's is pretty good. It has a way of getting to the different families, excuse me, different uh, plant species. But here's the trick. Unless a book has 
all of the plants of a certain area, unless a book has all of the species, you can't really prove it's not that species without knowing what species it might be that you're not looking at. So this book is really useful. It has most of the common plants of the Northeast. The Northeast, that's where I live. The Northeast goes from New Brunswick, Canada, down to somewhere in Virginia, over to somewhere in Indiana, and off to the tip of Long Island. So it covers a big area. And this book is well done. Most of the plants that you commonly see are in this book. But if you want to make medicine from them, how do you know it's not something that they don't cover? This is the problem when some people buy medicinal books like Michael Moore's or the Foster Duke Peterson Guides. They're excellent books in their own right, but you can't really use them for plant identification because they tell you if you found the right plant what it looks like, but what if you found a plant that looks like that plant and you said all, that, all those things match, but you don't know what plant it really is. So I'm not sure this makes perfect sense, but I am saying in order to really know what plant it is, you have to be able to delete or to, to say it's not all these other plants to reduce it by knowing all the plants of an area. Was that easily understood? Probably not, but eventually you'll get it. So a book like Newcomb's is a really great place to start, but at one point you have to kick it up. So I'm going to show you some popular books of the Northeast to begin your identification exploration. So Newcomb's, uh, most books are really, everybody just calls them by the author, by the author's last name. Rarely do you say Newcomb's Wildflower Guide, or most of these you'll see I'll discuss as the author's last name. Uh, this is a good one for tree identification. It's done in the 70s and basically just has these big pictures. Those are stems with, um, with buds on them. And this is the fruits of plants. And so this is uh, C Simon's The Tree Identification Book. And this one is really good because they have photographs that are full size. And it's a good beginning to uh, try to identify trees. Once again, though, it's going to be hard to get exact species. But there are a lot less trees than there are other kinds of plants in most areas. Another book for this area that I like that works great with Newcombs. So Newcombs, back to this. Newcombs is black and white line illustrations, which are really my favorite. I think most botanists really like black and white line illustrations because you, you can capture the general characteristics. Photographs, you can only capture one plant at one time. But this book, called Wildflowers in the Field and Forest, uh, has photographs of them. So it's really nice if you use Newcombs and this, they cover the same area. You can also see photographs. They use the same kinds of systems of identification. And this is not very common. It just came out like two or three years ago. But it's a good, it works well with the two together. So next is I'm going to show the kinds of books that eventually most of us will start using if we want to make accurate meaning species identification of plants. They all tend to be bigger and they cover different regions. So this is, so the word flora of the Northeast, when you see the word flora in this sense, a flora tends to mean a complete plant guide for an area, meaning all the, all the plants of an area, all the uh, genera, genera is the, is the plural genus, genus single, genera, more than one genus. Um, and so the floras have pretty much all the plants of an area. This one has also some photographs, so excuse me, some black and white line illustrations. But this one's for the Northeast, which actually doesn't include this region, because <laughs> we are the mid-Atlantic states. But it's pretty good, and it covers pretty close. So I'm not going over the title so much, but this is the flora of the Northeast. So a book like this covers a pretty large area. The book that we use in my school covers an even larger area, and it's called the manual. Everybody calls it Gleason and Cronquist, or G and C. Those are the authors. But it's the Manual of the Vascular Plants of Northeastern United States and Adjacent Canada. And now you can see why we don't all call it that. <laughs> and it has a really small print and a lot of words, but it covers that area that Newcombs does that I mentioned a minute ago. So it covers all the way up into northern Canada, all the way somewhere south of Jersey or Virginia, over to the shore, the eastern shore, and over to somewhere like the Plains, basically Indiana, Illinois. Um, it's dense. It has a lot of information. All of them have their own mistakes. But this one just means if you buy this, you get like a fourth of the United States in a book. Uh, but it's very technical. But this is the one that uh, 
I recommend for my students because it's the best for what it is. Some areas have really good floras online. So the southeast of the United States, which actually hadn't had a good flora since like 1905, uh, now has a flora that's absolutely free online, and it's Weekly. The guy's last name is Weekly, W-E-A-K-L-E-Y. And if you just type in Weekly's flora, uh, all of a sudden you'll get a PDF, uh, you'll get a copy on your computer. Uh, you could, I guess, make a paper copy, though it would be huge. But, so some of the floras are online. There is a flora of North America that's far from complete, but that's also free and online. Some of us, like myself, will still buy the book so you can carry it into the field. So one thing you might have noticed, this is the northeastern flora. So it's a little confusing. This says northeast. This actually is in this book. So this is northeast, meaning basically Vermont, Maine, New Hampshire, and a little bit of New York and Massachusetts, Rhode Island. This northeast is that much more inclusive range. And one thing you might have noticed is zero pictures, zero illustrations, no photos, which is good, because otherwise it would be huge. And so somebody made a book called The Illustrated Companion, the DNC, Christian Conquest, that does just that. So I would recommend, if you're going to go this route, to spend the extra money. This is $125, this book. And you can see that mine is waterlogged. And all of, the, all of these plants in this book are in this book, but with black and white line illustrations, which, of course, is really excellent to have. So I'd recommend getting both of these together. Some of the books will cover a smaller area. And basically, the smaller the area, the easier to use. So for instance, this book is called The Plants of Pennsylvania. So it only has plants of Pennsylvania. The beauty of that, it means that plants that grow in Virginia or Indiana or northern Canada aren't in here. So when you're trying to identify them, you don't have to exclude plants that don't grow there. So in other words, the more particular the flora, and a flora is a book that contains all the plants of an area, the more specific a location it is, the easier it is to use because you have a lot less excluding all the other plants. And I've already shown you some of the tools that I used. And once again, I'm suggesting start easy. It will definitely get frustrating. For everybody who does botany, there's a learning curve. And initially, it's just really hard and a lot of looking at plants and just wanting to know what they were and wondering why different authors disagree on different uh, on different ways of assessing which species is the same species. But for us who make medicine out of plants, it's pretty important that we know what species is in that medicine. So if you're from an area and you never moved, and there's somebody who's really excellent at knowing what all the plants are and you learn from them, that of course is a fantastic way to learn plants. I mean, I think for everybody, it's really it just feels good to know somebody who knows the plants and point them out and say what they are. The problem is, once you leave that area, or if new plants come into that area, all of a sudden everything switches up a little bit. So I'm not speaking against learning from local people. Like native plant societies are often great places to learn plants. Um, garden clubs can be great places to learn plants. Just knowing people in bot who just love plants is a great way to learn plants. And then, once you learn the basics, uh, just try to find some people who can help you learn, teach you how to do these, uh, this kind of more accurate identification or, or more expanded accurate identification. And I think that you'll find that initially frustrating, but what happens is as you start to pick apart the plants, and the, the book says uh, stamen, six and two series, four and two. And once you know what you mean and you look in there, you go, holy, whatever you would say to, after holy. And you'd think, wow, it really exists in this. And so... I think that after a while, the beauty of botany and the beauty of small details starts to really show up and, and, and will help you, I think, both appreciate the nature around you and make better plant medicine. Mm -hmm.